thanks for the introduction. Um, so I felt that this session would be a good place for me to present some of my results, and thanks very much for accepting me. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about um, the site that I'm looking at, um, which is Drum Clay Cranog, but first of all I want to set it in its historical, um, archaeological and chronological background um, in relation to Ireland. So early medieval Ireland, like most of Europe, had, was a period of great change. Um, and transition, we see a number of different sites emerging in the landscape during this period, um, from early monastic sites to a range of settlement sites, including enclosed settlements like rocks and cashels. We also have crown oaks, which are normally found in lakes. We also see from the documentary evidence, um, particularly in the form of the annals, um, shifting power structures and local territorial disputes in the 9th century, and an island-wide social reorganisation and the establishment of the first towns between the 9th and 11th century. Um, in terms of our understanding of the settlement pattern of early medieval Ireland, um, Elizabeth Patrick argues that we have a fixation on establishing the construction dates of sites, and this has been detrimental to a deeper understanding of how settlements developed um, and how they responded to social change. This disproportionate value that is placed on the origins and foundations of sites in comparison to its evolution and story over time has meant that particularly with dryland sites our broader understanding is limited. While this should not be an issue for wetland sites because of the high levels of preservation, problems still exist in terms of our chronological understanding. So looking at Crown Oaks, um, what is it? It's basically an artificial man-made island or lake edge settlement um, they're almost exclusively found in Ireland and Scotland. There are about 1,200 known examples of this site type in Ireland. And while some have prehistoric origins, the majority of the dates date them to the early medieval and the medieval period. Um, however, because only on a very rare occasion we get to investigate them to any great degree, the majority of this site type appears like the picture on the far right in the landscape. So this brings up issues of availability of timbers and accessibility. Um, considering this, our understanding of the chronology of Crown Oaks is in reality based on spot dates of available or accessible timbers. So um, Drum Clay Crown Oak itself is located here in the north of Ireland um, on the edge of Loch Erne. Um, between 2012 and 2013, I was one of many archaeologists who excavated on this site. Only 29 crown oaks of the 1,200 known examples in Ireland have been excavated to any degree. Um, and this excavation at Drum Clay is unique because while there's been a significant amount of work into crown oaks in recent years, um, and these have included some small scale excavations, this is by far the largest scale excavation under modern scientific um, standards. The excavation itself revealed a wealth of waterlogged deposits. Um, measuring 26 metres by 18 metres with a depth of 7. Um, around 5,500 artefacts were uncovered from this site, ranging from amber, bone, glass, leather, metal, pottery, textile, so on. So it's a really good representation of early medieval material culture. Um, the site was initially dated by artefact typology and a few wide-ranging radiocarbon dates. This suggested that the site had a long, uh, a long occupation um, from at least the 7th century to the 16th, 17th century. In terms of the structural components excavated, um, 57 platforms and 30 houses were initially identified. It was acknowledged that more would be identified during post-excavation um, analysis. For example, the picture on your right, that's been recorded as a single platform but it contains 12 layers of overlapping roundwoods. So this just goes to show the sheer volume of material that we're working with. Um, over 9,000 pieces of structural wood were retained for post excavation analysis, and these were predominantly alder. So alder, unlike oak, doesn't have a monster chronology to cross state against. Um, it's, actually, it's a very difficult species to work with because it's quite short-lived. Um, but it's also um, very sensitive to local environmental signals. 
However, because of the sheer volume of material that we had from the site and that um, it was mainly algae being used, we were able to build a relative chronology for the construction episodes of the site. And by using a combination of tree ring analysis, targeted radiocarbon dates, and wiggle match modelling, the chronology could be fixed to a model time scale of 800 to 880 AD for the initial construction. This firmly places the construction of the site in the 9th century and not in the 7th century, which was previously believed. believed sorry. Um, this discrepancy in dating has big implications when contextualising data, particularly when dealing with a period of such change as is the case with early medieval Ireland. So the site was uh, originally excavated in six different zones, and this was due to practicality reasons and because of the scale of the excavation. Um, but what it meant was that the, um, the outer chronology has now been able to tie these areas back in together, both vertically and horizontally. So this, is, uh, this resulted in what I'm calling a dendromatrix. So um, you see on the left side, you have the relative time scale, and these are the construction episodes year by year. Um, on the other side, you have the model time scale, and then the um, matrix in the center. So you can see how, these, how the relationships are being resolved. So this is my, um, this is the wiggle match model. There was um, poor arrangement between two of the samples. Now you can see this, their high probability would make them go here, but that, um, that would make them overly young. What we think is actually after happening is that it's after, the two, the two samples were taken in five blocks of annual range from two different platforms, and we have a chronological overlap of three years. So what it looks like might have happened here is we've crossed, intersected a spike in the radiocarbon curve, um, which, if, if any of you know about it, is 775. Um, it's been used as a chronological marker on both hemispheres now, um, and that's still quite preliminary. I've sent in um, a suite of dates, around, of single, year, single ring dates, around that um, period, so I'm waiting on confirmation that that's what we have. But what that will mean is that the initial construction date could be extrapolated out to 811 AD, which is an absolute date. So this also means that the platforms that are being resolved will get an absolute date, and so will their material culture. So I'm just going to look at this in a, little, in a more kind of visual way. This was the footprint of the Cranog, um before or after excavation. So the chronology t tells us that the first area was constructed here, um, this was on uh, piles dri driven into the lake sediment. Um, we got a natural progression into the central area, um, but pl platforms were also being built on the first area to consolidate it. The following year, construction extended to the west, and then the following year to the southeast, so it gives, or southwest, so it gives a quite logical progression of construction. I don't have any tempers from this area, but the stratigraphic information tells me that it, it happened sometime after the southwest. Um, the final area to be constructed was the northern area, um, and this was constructed 10 years after initial construction. And this can perhaps be um, used as an explanation for why this happened, because at some point in antiquity it became detached and subsided, and this is what we found during excavation. So it's just helping to explain, um, it's just helping to explain. So um, as my research continues, uh, more and more platforms are being anchored to this time scale. Um, and if I can confirm the 77 spike, 775 spike sorry, in my chronology, these platforms, as well as their related finds and material culture, will be tied to an absolute date. Um, this work has already improved our understanding of some of the finds discovered on the site. The picture here to the left is of one of the platforms that has already been resolved, um, and we've dated it to the 9th century. Um, as you can see, the rectangular shapes here um, 
on, on those two timbers represents mortis joints. Um, and seeing as they don't um, they don't serve any apparent purpose in this platform, they've been uh, interpreted as reused timbers. Um, considering yes, yeah, right. Um, this the fact that these were reused has been further confirmed um, because we dated one of these timbers. We took blocks of five five blocks of five annual rings and weather match model them, and this produced a felling a modelled felling date of. 750 to 790 AD. As I previously mentioned, the earlier 7th century date suggested for the origins was primarily based on wide-ranging radiocarbon dates and artifact typology. In particular, this bird-headed bone comb, which um, on typological grounds was dated to between the 7th and 8th century. This artifact was also recovered from the lower levels of the site and these are broadly contemporary. They were, it's my opinion that they represent older objects being brought in from elsewhere and repurposed on the site. So here we're also getting an idea of activity in the local area before the construction of the panel. So um, in conclusion, it's anticipated that the changes and developments of the site will continue to be revealed through the elder chronology giving us a refined picture of the evolution of the site from the 9th to the 17th century AD. As further platforms are resolved, we will be able to, question, we will be able to answer questions like, was there continuous occupation through time, or was it abandoned and later re-established? Um, this tight chronological framework can be used to investigate periods of environmental or socio-political change and how this impacted the site's development. These results will then be viewed against the wider landscape context and finally, in a broader sense, how this annual narrative can inform us about settlement and social change during the early medieval period right up to the later medieval period. Um, in conclusion, I believe that this research will allow us to view this time period not through the prism of deep time but, as the re um, but at a resolution relevant to the occupants of the site. Um, I just want to say thanks to my funding body and the HED for granting me access to the material and particularly Jackie Mattek.